All right. Well, thank you all for uh, being here this afternoon. We have a great program lined up for you now. And before we get into our speaker, I would like to share a little bit about Old Ways. If you, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a nonprofit nutrition education um, whose mission is to inspire people to embrace the healthy and sustainable uh, joys of the old ways of eating. Uh, those are heritage diets that are based, that are high in taste, nutrition, flavor, and sustainability. And since 1990, we've helped people live healthier, happier lives by offering educational programs, resources, and recipes based on shared cultural food traditions from around the world. It's a mission we take very great pride and joy in with proven nutritional and emotional benefits. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, we do have a great speaker for you. Before I get into that, I wanted to go over some housekeeping notes first and to let you know that video recording and slides will be posted on our website within a week of today's presentation. And you'll also get a follow-up email within a week telling you how you can claim your CPEU certificates. And this email will also have the slides and the recording. Uh, also, if you have any questions for either the speakers this afternoon, please type your questions in the Q&A box. We'll have a time for Q&A at the end. Also, we hope you can join us for our upcoming webinar. We'll be announcing our spring lineup very soon. So on to today's speakers. Uh, first, we have myself. I'm Adati Hart, Outreach Dietitian here at Old Ways. I have had the honor to be with this program we'll be speaking on today since the beginning as an instructor, also as an ambassador. So it's a very, program is very near and dear to me. So I'm honored to be speaking about it today. We also have featured Dr. Samara Sterling. She's a nutrition scientist and health communicator with expertise in the use of plant-based nutrition for the prevention of chronic diseases. Uh, she works as the research director for the Peanut Institute, where she leads research protocols, grant management, media health communication, and is actively involved in regulatory issues and nutrition policy. We'll be hearing from Samira uh, shortly. So first, I wanted to talk to you about the African heritage diet and ask, answer the question, well, what is the African heritage diet? And before I get into the, the diet piece, I wanted to review what the African diaspora is, because you also often hear this term, the African diaspora or diaspora, and it simply refers to a scattering of any people from the original homeland. And in the context of this presentation, uh, the African diaspora encompasses those groups of people of African descent that were either on continental Africa and for food purposes, we're talking West and Central Africa. Also those people of African descent who were uh, transported throughout different parts of the world due to the slave trade. So we're looking at the Caribbean, Latin America and the American South. Now, of course, enslaved were ferried to other parts of the world, but in terms of this uh, regional cuisine that we're talking about that uh, encompasses this diet, we're looking at these four main regions being continental Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, and the American South. And just as a reminder, you know, Africa is a continent that's comprised of over 54 countries, over 1,500 different languages, and a variety of culinary diversity. So when we talk about the African heritage diet, just know that always has been working with different cultural models of healthy eating since its inception. We work with subject matter experts to, love, to develop several heritage diet pyramids over the years. So first with the Mediterranean diet pyramid, which some of you may be familiar with already. We've also done work for Asian heritage diet pyramid as well as the vegetarian diet, Latin American, and today we're talking the African heritage diet pyramid. <clears throat> and as you can see here, our committee includes culinary historians, nutrition scientists, and public health experts, each focus on African descendant health and history. And today they continue to offer their expertise with their African Heritage and Health program. So in 2011, with the support from the Walmart Foundation, we assembled an advisory committee, uh, as you saw the previous slide, and we developed the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, which is pictured here. This pyramid illustrates the healthy foods and traditional eating patterns of the African diaspora. It also celebrates the healthy culinary traditions practiced by people of African descent across Africa, Central and South America, the Caribbean, and the American South. And a few more notes about the pyramid. It's not necessarily a diet, as some would think in the traditional sense, but it really represents a way of eating. And it differs from the traditional food pyramids of the 90s in that it actually reflects what people eat rather than what, you know, what people, quote unquote, should eat. Uh, when you look at the pyramid, the way they interpret it is to base meals on foods toward the bottom of the pyramid. So you see at the base, you see a lot of green leafy vegetables, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans and legumes, and tubers, 
And these are all the base meaning that every meal should uh, pull from foods from these categories. And as you move forward further to the top of the pyramid, you know, eating these uh, foods a little less often. And as you get all the way to the top, there are foods that should be eaten occasionally. So during times of celebration or special occasions. And then if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, it also focuses on those non-nutrition factors. So things like eating together with others, physical activity, because those are just as important as the nutrition. And in comparing the African heritage diet versus standard American diet, you see a very a number of stark differences. So from a traditional African heritage diet pattern, it is plant-based. Plants are the star of the plate. Um, it's not animal-based. So in, it was in standard American diet, you would see mostly meat accompanied with vegetables. It's actually flipped. If you look at a traditional African heritage diet pattern, meat is there sometimes, but it's used as a flavoring more so than uh, just the main thing. Uh, that pattern is also a whole food based um, you know, plan as opposed to you know, mostly fast food and prepackaged ultra processed foods. The African heritage diet pattern is also high in fiber, complex carbs, whole grains, cereals, starchy vegetables and tubers as opposed to the standard American diet which is characterized by being low in fiber and higher in refined flours and grains. Additionally, when it comes to sodium where the standard American diet is high in sodium, Traditional African heritage diet patterns are naturally low in sodium. And then finally, the African heritage diet pattern is lower in the unhealthier fats and refined sugars than the standard American diet, which is sometimes characterized by fried foods, soft drinks, and sugary sweetened beverages. So with the support of the Walmart Foundation, we use the pyramid as a framework to create a taste of African heritage, which is a six week cooking and nutrition curriculum based on the healthy plant-based foods of the African diaspora. We had the finished curriculum reviewed by Constance Brown Riggs for nutritional content and Dr. Jessica B. Harris for uh, cultural and culinary context. Then the curriculum was piloted at 15 sites across the country to refine the flow and the class and, and optimize the recipes before rolling out to the general public in 2012. So with a taste of African heritage, it's given both in person and online, you know, during COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of things had to switch to virtual, including this. So we, you know, created an online option as well as an e-course for people to take. Uh, the course also includes pre and post surveys, which actually helped us um, publish an article on this paper, which I'll talk about uh, later on this session. This also includes a children's curriculum. We developed a curriculum um, for children in elementary and middle schools. And as I'll discuss later, a taste of African heritage is now included in the snap -Ed toolkit as an evidence-based uh, intervention. So that's a little bit about the program. And I wanna show you this video that really goes into detail about the program. You'll be able to hear more from our instructors and ambassadors and learn more about the program. Having some technical difficulties here. Let me just close here. Oh, here we go. This is more than just about food. It really is about shaping people's identity and how they see themselves through their food, how they see their culture being a part of their health solution. The Taste of African Heritage and Health program is for anyone, whether it's been trying to lose weight, improve their health, lacking cooking skills, don't know other creative ways, enhance their meals in their homes. The research really does show that when we eat a more traditional heritage diet that we improve our health outcomes and I think that's really the core of what Old Ways is about and what um, it's doing in terms of helping the community this program now with the Taste of African Heritage and Health. African Heritage Diet Pyramid was created with a committee of nutrition scientists, experts in culinary history and African American foodways. It's much easier to do because you can identify with that. I know what greens are and so I can identify with, eat a lot of this. You can have uh, the brown rice and the millet and, and you know, the, uh, the barley. You have all of these healthy whole grains here. And those kinds of grains that really is a part of the heritage that needs to be built upon. 
on top of that, the, the tubers, the healthy starches from the yams to the sweet potatoes. And then you have the balance of uh, fruits that will come from uh, everything from the tropical fruits like the papayas, the melons, the mangoes, the pineapples, the bananas, plantains, um, and them serving as really desserts compared to what we traditionally have now. Once you sort of shift your mindset to looking at your plate as more of a heritage plate, it's gonna redefine everything that you can put on there. So when you look at a plate now and you say, that should have some whole grains, or that should have and beans, and my greens, and my vegetables, um, fruit for dessert. It is so empowering. This, this idea of um, connecting to your heritage and improving your health through connecting to your heritage. In the Taste of African Heritage and Health program, we evaluate how the students are going through the process and what lessons that we can learn to improve the program and what it has mean for their life and for their family and most of all, how they have improved their health. So my name is Danessa, Danessa Bowling. I live in Houston. I am actually on my fourth series of the class. I committed myself to do this for a full year. So it was a, a time of a serious transition for me. And so at this point, I had lost my mom, my grandmother, and my aunt to cancer. It's like, okay, being realistic, I'm overweight, I'm at risk for diabetes, yeah, I'm African American. I just didn't know what to do. I can't control cancer. I can't control heart disease. I can't control diabetes. I can control this. This is my thing I can do. And so I thought, well, I'll do it and I'll teach it and it'll help me. Is in addition to teaching and learning and eating healthy, you get this sense of community with people. This idea of culture being a part of your medicine. We talk about cultural competency, but we never really see the integration of culture in the form of community programs. And the Taste of African Heritage and Health program does the very thing that the community has been longing for and why it's being embraced so much more than ever and why it's so desperately needed. I believe that this can be the thing that could bring people together, where we could break down some barriers that we never thought could be broken down with food. The idea of our culture and our community they both are tied into our cuisine, can be a part of our medicine, our nutrition. That's what this program provides more than ever. All right. And next you'll hear from Samira Sterling. All righty, thank you, Dante. And hello, everyone. It's a privilege for me to be here today. It's always exciting to be part of uh, amazing work that's being done by old ways. So thank you so much for sharing that. And as we transition, I wanted to entitle this section, Celebrating the Cultural Lunchbox. And you'll see why I've titled it this way. That'll be a bit of a running theme. Um, first, I want to say happy Black History Month, right? This is a time that we get a chance to celebrate our heritage. We get a chance to commemorate the achievements of Black people in the history of the United States. And I think this webinar is a perfect opportunity to have that celebration. So happy Black History Month. I have a question for y'all. What is one of your favorite foods or dishes? And if you can tell us what country or culture it is from, if you know, that'd be awesome. Just go ahead and type it in the chat. I would be so curious to know what some of your favorite foods might be from various countries, from various cultures. Feel free to let us know. We look forward to hearing some of your answers. And I wanna start this webinar by giving a, ooh, I'm seeing some good answers in the chat already. Continue to keep them flowing in. I want to start with this children's story called The Yuckiest Lunchbox by Debbie Lynn. And in this story, we were introduced to a young girl named Nari, and she's Korean American, and her mom prepares traditional Korean foods for her to eat during lunch at school. And so she opens up her lunchbox, and oh my goodness, she's really happy because she loves what she sees. Her favorite is kimbap. If you like kimbap like me, then you know why it's her favorite, right? And so she opens it up, but then to her surprise, there's another kid in school who's like, ew, what's that green stuff? This is yucky. How could you be eating that? Ew, ew, that's slimy. 
And so that completely changes Nari's perspective. She starts to cry. And so she now tells her mom, mom, don't you ever cook me Korean food again, okay? I just want to eat American food. Whatever American food is, only put that in my lunchbox from now on, okay? And her mom has to try to tell her that her culture is nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, her culture is something that she needs to be proud of. And it wasn't until one of the other children's moms comes and it's like, wait, what is that that you're eating? Can I try some kimbap? And she tries it and she loves it. Then the other students love it and hip, hip, hooray. Now her culture is celebrated. And when I think of this concept of the cultural lunchbox, it, it denotes this idea of a place of acceptance and celebration of heritage. Of course, Nari shouldn't have to go through this whole ordeal in order to know that her culture is something that needs to be celebrated. However, she was able to recognize that through her experiences. Now, it made me realize that I also have some experiences with this. Um, so for myself, and I apologize, I see in the Q&A that uh, some people's chats are disabled there. But either way, I loved uh, seeing some of the cultural foods that you uh, highlighted in the chat there. So my experience, I am from, and if you can guess this here, this is where I am from. This is an island surrounded by water. It's in the Caribbean Sea. Anybody know what it is? I am from the beautiful island of Jamaica. I migrated to the, the United States, specifically to New York when I was 11 years old. And I can remember being homesick for my cultural foods. Oh my goodness, I love my breadfruit and my ackee and my kalalu and my, what you see on the right of your screen there is called Jamaican apple or ota eti apple. It looks like a pear, but it doesn't taste like one at all. Very good, it's still one of my favorite foods today. And I loved my culture. And I remember coming to a new place, being homesick, and then in some instances being forced to sort of change my palate to accommodate other foods. Now, there were some that I loved. There were some that I didn't love. The good thing was that New York really had a lot of Caribbean markets. So we were able to stay connected to our roots. But there is one story that I'll never forget. And not until I was preparing um, for this webinar did I remember that this was a really pivotal moment in my childhood. I remember we went to a family member's house and I won't, I won't call them out. I won't say which family member it was, okay? Because I love my family. I went to a family member's house and they served this carrot salad. Nothing against carrot salad. If you love carrot salad, more power to you, okay? But they served this carrot salad, which was carrots and mayonnaise and raisins. And that was sort of the strangest thing to me because I had never seen it before. I'd never tasted it before. And when I tasted it, I didn't like it. And I whispered to my mom and I was like, mommy, I don't wanna eat this. And my mom was, you know, she didn't want to um, be rude or anything like that. And but I remember my family member saying, you better eat it. It's good for you. You have to eat it. And in my childhood brain, I remember even thinking to myself, well, maybe I can just fake throwing up or make myself throw up so that they'll feel sorry for me. And then I don't have to eat it. Like these are the types of things that I was thinking during that moment. And the truth is, I should not have had to think of that. Why? Because this was this concept of dietary assimilation. You have to eat my food, even if it's not something that you're accustomed to, right? And I remembered that being such a shift in my mentality, even as a child, where I could relate to some of the experiences that our story, Nari, started with. And that's why I wanted to entitle this celebrating the cultural lunchbox. Because when we think about this idea of cultural appreciation and inclusivity, we see that there, there are diets that are celebrated. And I love the Mediterranean diet. I was in Spain twice last year in Barcelona and then on the countryside. And I love, I absolutely love the Mediterranean diet. And it's celebrated through research, through policy, through social rankings. However, the one thing I want to make sure that we are considering is that we can promote inclusivity by broadening our recommendations for what foods fit into a healthy diet. We have to consider culture as we are doing this. 
The Dietary Guidelines 2020 to 2025 highlights even four different dietary patterns. We have the US style dietary pattern, which is pretty generalized, right? Then we've got the uh, healthy vegetarian dietary pattern, the DASH diet. And then there's the healthy Mediterranean style dietary pattern. Again, very much celebrated. And we love to see this because I'm also a lover of the Mediterranean style diet. It's very region specific, right? And it does highlight uh, very many cultures. However, and I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the chat now. Yes, West African peanut soup, one of my favorite. Actually, Adante has a really good um, peanut soup recipe or peanut stew, correct me if I'm wrong. You can ask him for his recipe there. But healthy Mediterranean style dietary pattern. And so it leaves a lot of people thinking, where does my culture fit? Do I fit into this? Or do I need to start eating um, the Mediterranean diet? What if I don't like the Mediterranean diet? What am I supposed to eat? And where does my culture fit? And the truth is for a lot of people, we are seeing messages that tell them that their cultural foods don't fit at all. Take a look at some of these news stories that say Southern cooking may be killing African-Americans. I was fortunate enough to actually be a doctoral student who uh, my mentor worked on this study. So I'm very familiar with the data on this study. It's called the Regard Study. And this is what the media was talking about with Southern cooking, eating um, or killing African-Americans, sorry. But when you look at the Southern dietary pattern, it is one that's described as high in red and processed meats, high in fried foods, high in a, a key component of it, high in sugar sweetened beverages, right? But that is not necessarily specifically a Southern style diet. That is an American, that's an American problem, isn't it? Um, that's a Western problem, isn't it? Um, and even within that study, it showed that plant-based dietary patterns were most commonly consumed among female Black participants. But this is not something that we heard very much of, right? It was just whatever you eating, it, you are eating is killing you. And I think those messages are really powerful and really important. And we have to be careful in terms of what we are sending, that message that we're sending. Again, we get this question. So with all of these foods, you're telling me that my foods are killing me. Is there anything good about my food, about my culture? I'm also seeing some other Caribbeans in the chat, Trinidad and Tobago, Brazilian collard greens. Um, and I don't even wanna mess up some of the pronunciations there, but some people ask these questions. Now, the truth is as nutritionists and dietitians, nutrition professionals, we know that yes, High intakes of red and processed meats, fried foods, sugar sweetened beverages, that's a problem that we do need to address, right? But it is important that we frame it in the right way, that we identify and highlight the cultural aspects of foods that are, are important and that are nutritious because that messaging contributes to barriers. So here's an early study done by Dr. Dolores James out of Florida, landmark study that was done in African-Americans in Northern Florida that showed that folks thought of healthy eating as a major barrier. What was the misperception that they had was that eating healthy means giving up traditional cultural foods, family recipes, flavors, heritage, and get this, even identity. For those of us who are writing our favorite foods in the chat, you know it's something that is near and dear to our heart. Like that's something that you feel is part of your own identity when you talk about your food. And so if somebody's telling you, you've just got to give that up, that does a lot to your self image. So we really have to be careful. Also another misperception was that healthy foods just really have a poor taste. However, when we look deeper into the research, here's another one that was done at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, my alma mater. And what this study showed was that among African Americans, they were more likely than European Americans to describe collard greens, turnip greens, cabbage as their favorite foods. These are highly nutritious foods, right? Another 2020 study showed that 
30 to 50% of African Americans living in the South reported consuming things like greens, okra, corn, tomato, grits, sweet potatoes at least twice per month. So these are definitely some foods that we can highlight within the culture. I had an opportunity to speak with a mother in my community. She goes to my church, Miss Katie Johnson. She's 95 years old. She comes from a family. Uh, she lives in the Deep South, and her family was a family of sharecroppers. So this was a, an oppressive system for formerly en enslaved people. They farmed the land in exchange for a portion of the foods that were being planted. And what she shared with me about her history and what she knew was that many of the foods that we have today, a lot of the fast foods and fried foods, those weren't part of their traditional diets at all. In fact, they got their diets from their ancestors, black eyed peas, yams, eggplants, rice, peanuts. And in fact, they ate off the land. Okay, so they were eating a predominantly plant based dietary pattern. So that was something that I thought was really unique and really something to highlight. So when we talk about celebrating the cultural lunchbox, here are three tips. We highlight the nutrient foods that are found within that cultural context. So instead of telling everyone to eat kale, collard greens are okay. That's all right. And we can recommend collard greens, okay? Similar nutrition profile. Celebrate the rich flavors. If we are introducing newer foods within that dietary pattern, make sure that we're celebrating it. And if I want to use a spice from my culture, that's okay, try that spice. Um, herbs, spices, and sauces. And then we move on to teaching because the truth is there are many things that we can teach, right? We can teach about ways that enhance the nutrient density of our foods, steaming vegetables, proper plate proportions, and being more plant-centric. But this is the way I think is a better strategy as opposed to just saying, just go away with all your food, don't eat any more collard greens, eat kale instead. That's not something that's practical for a lot of people or even good nutrition advice. The other thing that we realize is that there is a movement back to plant forward eating within the black community, for example. So this was a poll that was done. The BBC reported in 2020 that 8% of black Americans, more than twice the amount of the US population reported being vegan or vegetarian. Uh, 20, a 2020 Gallup poll also found that 31% of non-white Americans had reduced their meat consumption in the past year. So there is that movement more towards eating plant forward. And again, it may not necessarily be strictly plant-based, but there is that movement towards eating more plants. And you see more restaurants pop up. I saw someone in the chat talk about Ethiopian food. And in fact, that is one of my favorite cuisines as well. I love my Maser Wat and my Injeta, and I love all those flavors there. Um, new vegan cafe, you see some soulful, soulful flavors popping up. That's one of my favorite restaurants in DC, Soul Vegetarian in Atlanta. And of course, you've got the Slutty Vegan in Atlanta as well. Almost feels like a curse word to say it, but it's the name of a restaurant if you haven't tried it. So I want to share with you um, in the second half of this presentation, I want to share with you an intervention that my team and I did here in the Deep South. This is a lot of where I received my training in the Deep South. So I wanted to, I wanted to do a lot of work here in my community because this is where I live, right? And I love the culture here. So this was a 12 week dietary intervention that was done to examine the effect of a soul food, plant-based lifestyle. And I say lifestyle because it's not just about avoiding meat, but it's about putting more plants on the plate. And this was done to examine risk for heart disease among Black adults in the Deep South, and also looking at risk for inflammation, which as we know is a marker for underlying heart disease and other chronic diseases. And then we also wanted to look at dietary behaviors and attitudes as a result of the intervention. So the components of this intervention Convention included weekly Monday night uh, virtual classes along Zoom. We did it over Zoom, virtual support groups. We had a private Facebook group. Weekly plant-based meals were given, weekly grocery boxes, produce boxes, meal plans, 
physical activity encouragement. And then we also did the before and after blood work. As you can see, we had tons of support for this 12 week intervention. This top um, picture here, you see all the cars coming by. This was in the height of COVID. So we couldn't necessarily do it in person. So what we would do is once a week when people were picking up their food, they would drive through this parking lot and then our staff would deliver the food to them, all this food that we got here. Again, this was done in the Deep South in a town called Albany, Georgia. Um, this is part of the Black Belt, which describes areas that have rich, dark soil and also where greater than 50% of the population is Black. So in Albany, it, uh, it's comprised of 73% Black, 23% White. The top three causes of death among Black individuals in the county where Albany is, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and much of the area based on the USDA map is situated in uh, food desert areas where there are low access to nutrition, there's low access to nutritious foods. As you can see, we had a ton of partners. There's no way we could have done it by ourselves. Goya was a really um, valued partner, Forager Project, American Heart Association, Walmart Publix, the Department of Public Health, as well as our local hospital. So we had a great number of partners. We also partnered with an organization that um, was a nonprofit organization that was there to, was started to help to provide plant-based soulful flavors of meals to residents in the community. We worked a lot with local farmers to provide fresh produce. Um, and this was an, this team was an integral part of the project, assisting with recruitment, education. You actually see Chef Mike over here. He's the chef. Um, we do a lot of work together even today. And also the food distribution within the community. Again, this was focused on plants and I just wanted to list here, there are already some familiar plant forward foods that we see within this southern style diet that is often demonized, unfortunately, within the literature. So things like black eyed peas and corn. In fact, I'll say that um, the main protein source from that intervention that we uh, recommended was coming from our plant sources like legumes, bees, peas, um, and lentils, and also peanuts, peanut butter, other nuts. Um, we also introduced some less common foods. So for example, yes, Red meat consumption uh, tends to be high in this area. And we did do a focus group that kind of helped to guide some of the recommendations that we instituted within this program. Um, but we definitely focused on familiar plant-based foods. And then of course we introduced some others that the community may not have been uh, familiar with in general, but again, with familiar flavors that they could appreciate. Surveys and assessment, we did a baseline meeting plus informed consent. We did do intake surveys. These are demographic surveys, dietary assessments, clinical measurements. And then at the end of the program, we did final surveys, dietary assessments and clinical measurements again. One of the main parts of our program, and I'll just say this, if you are thinking of doing a community program in a culture that may be different from your own, it's very important to involve community leaders and not just think, well, okay, so I know what I'm doing and I'll just, I'll just tell everybody what to do and I'll just teach everyone the right ways of nutrition. No, it's very important to incorporate the partnerships that you have within the community. And I think that was a really uh, big strength of the intervention that we did. So our community health leaders, we had five teams they were responsible for motivating participants throughout the week and also leading breakout groups in our Monday night sessions. They shared their own expertise and experiences and also recipes. Of course, we had a guided template that all our team leaders had to use. However, that personal touch was something that was there. And they were also there to help to build a sense of togetherness within their teams. You can see here what some of our lessons looked like. So we talked about dietary patterns that are centered around 
plant foods and how that can reduce risk for obesity, high blood pressure, heart problems, and diabetes. We talked about different uh, plant foods that help to decrease those risks. And as you can see, we have our instructor. He was actually a very well-respected pastor within this community, which we thought was another strength. It was one that our participants looked up to. And then on the right-hand corner there, you'll see one of our team leaders. He is actually a gardener. He has a huge garden in his backyard. And so he was teaching folks, as you can see right there, blueberries, how to grow blueberries, how to grow different foods in your, in your own backyard if you have limited resources, for example, or you just wanna be able to utilize the space that you have to grow some of your own foods. And this is a picture or a couple snippets of the uh, cooking demonstrations that our chef did. So on the top left-hand corner, you'll see uh, crab cakes, plant-based crab cakes. They're made with garbanzo beans or chickpeas and hearts of palm. And as you can see, participants really loved it. This is actually a picture of one of the participants' food, um, sharing how they were able to sort of mimic the recipe that Chef Mike showed. And then you can see buffalo tofu bites there in the bottom right-hand corner, served with a cashew-based uh, ranch sauce. This is a picture of the weekly food and meals and goodies that participants got. So you see their grocery boxes there with all the Goya goodies, the produce. And I will mention here that one of the things that we did was that the recipes that we wrote with the help of some of um, our interns, dietetic interns, um, the recipes that we wrote, we gave them in conjunction with the uh, produce items that we were giving and the food box items that we were giving. So as you can see, when we were giving out collard greens, well, there's a recipe for smoky collard greens that uses smoked paprika or even liquid smoke, et cetera, to sort of flavor that collard, the collard greens in a way that folks were accustomed to. And then they also got in these green bags here, the chef prepared meals that they were able to try each week. Here are some recipe examples. Again, as you can see, there was a heavy focus on the, the legumes. So Southern black eyed peas, we've got gumbo in there, baked beans. We even have a beefy vegan chili um, that for folks actually really enjoyed that one. That was one of their favorite dishes. You can see some of their photos. Um, and one of the things that we thought was important was to again, build that sense of community. You see also, um, we highlighted the cultural flavors. So you see what I from the Caribbean call rice and peas, but um, I know this may be called rice and beans, depending on um, the culture that you may be from, some bok choy, and you've got plantains there as well. So folks were really enjoying being able to incorporate the lessons that they were learning. And as you can see, these are nutrient dense foods, and they even had some friendly competition amongst themselves as they were sharing these photos as well. So what were some of our results? What did we find in our program? <clears throat> Here's just a look at our demographics. We did skew heavily towards females. So 92% of our participants were females. We had a, a pretty even spread across income levels and education levels, pretty high BMI in the obese category, and then a middle-aged group of participants. One third of our participants though did report having some form of food insecurity as measured by the USDA Food Security Survey. So that's a really, um, that's a really important tip or point to mention there. First, let's look at the dietary behavior results. What we see, and these are all self-reported, right? So, I mean, people can people may underestimate or overestimate when it comes on to self-reporting. However, they're self-reporting both at baseline and at final. So um, it's a pretty good estimation of sort of the changes that we may see throughout the 12-week program. You can see that fruit consumption doubled throughout the program. 90% um, increase in vegetable consumption. And this was mainly geared towards a lot of the dark green leafy vegetables. So your collards and your turnip greens, et cetera. Um, also whole grain consumption increased. And then we also saw a significant decrease in consumption of nutrients to limit. So cholesterol, saturated fat, added sugar, sodium, even caffeine, which we weren't even trying to, to target. We just saw that overall people were really motivated to improve their dietary habits. And and I see a question in the chat around grocery shopping tips and skills. Yes, that was part of our um, educational lessons as well. And that's one of the results that we saw. 
We saw an improvement in confidence to prepare or plan meals before grocery shopping, reading nutrition facts labels while grocery shopping, using a grocery list, more confidence in preparing healthy meals, and more confidence in using healthier substitutes for meals as well. And what did we see when it came on to the biomedical markers? Well, we saw um, that there was a significant decrease in both body mass index and waist circumference. Very importantly, we wanted to make sure we got multiple measures of body composition, just because we're aware of the uh, research towards body mass index and how that may be uh, not well estimated specifically in Black women um, and various cultures. So we wanted to make sure we captured multiple elements of that. Um, and then cholesterol, we saw a 13% reduction total cholesterol, 10% reduction LDL cholesterol, high sensitive C-reactive protein, there was a 25% reduction in that. We did see a trend towards reduction in TMAO or trimethylene nitric oxide. However, that one, I think we'll have to measure that again because I don't like our lab was not accustomed to measuring TMAO lab core, for example. So um, they actually lost some of our samples. So that resulted in a lower sample size for that. But we did see the trend there within the study. What I thought was really interesting um, when we asked participants at the beginning of the program uh, to agree or disagree with this statement, this was from a validated survey, which said a diet without meat is satisfactory and nutritious. We saw basically a bit half and half, neutral or disagree, 46%, only 46% agreed or strongly agreed. However, by the end of the program, we saw that 95% of participants agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. So beliefs and attitude towards plant-centered diets really significantly improved by the end of the program. And I'll mention here again that our aim was not to convert everyone to a fully plant-based diet, right? Our aim was to increase more plants in the dietary pattern. And that's effectively what we saw. When it came on to program feasibility, acceptability, and retention, the program was very highly rated among participants. Mean weekly attendance was 93%. Food and grocery box redemption was 98%. I always look at that data point and think, well, yeah, of course, if you're getting free food, of course. I mean, if I'm getting free food, I'm going to go pick up free food, right? So 98%. So no surprise there. Um, top, top motivations for engaging and remaining in the program, though, the top three that people noted, lesson content. So they really valued the information that they were getting. Um, food and grocery box redemption and also the virtual support groups, people really value. And in fact, when we did our six month survey, I don't have it here, but when we did our six month survey, that is one of the things that keeps coming up even now to this day. We want to keep having that support group. It's an integral part of many African cultures or Afro-Caribbean cultures is having that community base because what we eat tends to be so connected to our communities. So that is one thing we saw important. Um, most highly rated meals, lasagna, black bean burgers, and lentil meatloaf. We did have, of course, some limitations to this study. It was quasi-experimental. It was a pilot study, so randomization was not feasible. Um, so interpret those results uh, cautiously. Majority of our participants were women. And of course, we know the uh, limitations there with a 24-hour recall. But of course, we did the best we can in terms of that interpretation there. Other things to consider, and I did see someone kind of mention uh, some of these things in the chat, is that Changes towards more plant-forward eating can be challenging in certain communities when you have a high prevalence of food deserts. Uh, and there's it's a complex problem that requires the entire community and it, it requires so many different solutions to tackle. However, we are really fortunate that we were able to apply what we knew and use the tools that we have to help to effect some change there. What are some of our future directions? Of course, larger scale randomized control trials that oversample men, 
and also making sure that we keep those community partnerships with our public health organizations, hospitals, and food justice advocates. We do have some ongoing work, and I've included a couple pictures there. You see Chef Mike, I'm sure you feel like you know him by now, um, because we continue to host nutrition education sessions. We organize month-long cooking and nutrition education classes, and we are also working on partnering with the local hospital to host a health fair, and that's going to be coming up in July. Um, again, of course, the data piece, if you are somebody on here that does research as well, you know that it's pretty intensive, but it's a work that we believe in. So it's something that we want to continue. And right before I pass it over to Adante, I just want to leave us with three tips. How do I celebrate cultural lunchboxes in my own work? And bonus for you, if you know what food I have on this slide right here, if you know what it is. I mean, I guess it could be anything, right? Um, but for example, first tip, consider and honor your client's cultural food heritage or food traditions. I see somebody saying it in the chat, cornmeal porridge, yes. I saw hominy, which could be hominy, yes. Cornmeal porridge is on that slide. So for example, your client or your patient might prefer cornmeal porridge over bran muffins, for example, and that's okay, okay? So be prepared to consider, honor that, celebrate that. Breakfast foods in some cultures may be similar to lunch and dinner foods, uh, sort of the, 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 the foods that are there. So just sort of be aware of that. Another thing I'll mention is as you review the general recommendations of the dietary guidelines, because it's a great tool for us as nutrition professionals to use, but be sure to involve your client slash patient in identifying where their favorite foods fit on that plate. Visual representation of cultural foods promote pride and acceptance, and that's so important. And then another thing I'll mention is it's really important to utilize culturally representative handouts that promote positive imagery when possible. So if you are using handouts, it's a very simple thing, but think about it from we saw in the beginning with, you know, Southern diets are bad. If these are all the messages that we are hearing, then that doesn't do much to improve our own cultural pride and self-efficacy and motivation and feeling like we can actually eat um, healthfully in our own spheres. So those three tips, and I'll leave you with a picture of my team here, Veggie and Soul. Eat more veggies, live with soul. I'm, I give special thanks to all the staff because it's something we wouldn't be able to do without them. And yes, Kerr, one of my personal favorites is actually peanut porridge as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and I'll pass it over to Adante. Thank you so much, Samir, for that wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, I hope everyone else did as well. Uh, Samara, everyone is asking about these recipes. So I don't know if we can make that happen. Some of the recipes you showed, we can get that to them. But I mean, this was incredible and just highlights just the need for, you know, culturally inclusive research in these areas. And I mean, the study was so meticulously put together and I'm just, I'm blown away by this. So thank you very much, Samara. Let me share my screen and I have a few things left to share. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, we will try to create a couple few minutes for Q&A. If you have questions, please use the uh, Q&A feature in, uh, in Zoom. And also for those of you that may have joined us a little later, the recordings of this presentation and the slides we made available within a week, it'll be on our website. You also get a follow-up email with uh, telling you how to claim your CPEU certificates. Um, so just keep an eye out for that in a week. And that being said, let's go on. So I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the um, evidence around traditional African heritage diets, including taste of African heritage. And so as you see here, uh, we have studies that have shown that switching to a traditional African diet has shown increased uh, markers, improved markers for various um, diseases, whether it's cancer, reduced inflammation, also has shown to be, uh, improve the gut microbiome. And we also see, as we've seen with you know, uh, the Veggie Soul study that providing these culturally appropriate interventions that focus on the healthy foods, 
they are enjoying black cuisine can actually promote good nutrition so again it's not about demonizing you know the quote-unquote bad foods but really like samara said highlighting uplifting those nutrient dense those flavorful foods that are part of the culture and then lastly, uh, we saw another study that showed that making these culturally sensitive modifications to these uh, programs can lead to improved health markers. So when it comes to a taste of African heritage, we actually, the study was actually uh, published in the Journal of Nutrition, Education and Behavior last year. And so I'm not going to go into all the details. You can look up the article uh, yourself. Uh, but just quickly, you know, we wanted to look at the changes in cooking and dietary behaviors and health outcomes uh, following folks that participate in a taste of African heritage. And again, this was a six week program. Um, so we looked at a group that was a pre and post, as I said earlier, we do surveys at the beginning and the uh, end of the program, as well as some physical assessments that are optional. And we had about, uh, after all the exclusion criteria, about 586 to 600 uh, people. And we looked at the weekly frequency of cooking, uh, intake of various food groups and exercise. Again, this was all assessed by uh, self-reported surveys as well as a few anthropometric measurements. And so in terms of the results, again, you can look at the paper, but I wanted to distill the results into these uh, key findings. We saw that 98% of adult participants reported that the history and heritage were their motivators for eating and living well, going back to uh, what was on Samir's last slide, that these are the real motivators. It's not necessarily, you know, you need to do be eat better to avoid this, but no, it's really about uplifting and sharing that pride, the cultural pride around those foods. Uh, we also saw that blood pressure decreased in the groups that participated in the taste of African heritage. And finally, another statistic was that almost 30% of participants reduced their blood pressure by a full stage um, after participating in this program. And so I've shown you all some of the results, but what's most important, again, I've been teaching this class for about a decade. And, you know, the most important things are the testimonies, what the participants are actually saying. So I have a few testimonials here that I won't read for time's sake, but, you know, just to paraphrase, some people, they, you know, either didn't know how to start healthy eating or just, they just didn't know. And so by taking this class, they learned more about their culture, their heritage, and really, uh, seeing it in a new light instead of it being demonized and saying it's bad for you. Uh, also, some of our instructors saw positive things in our com in their communities. Um, and then lastly, you know, we have people that you know, spoke to the cultural significance of a class like this, that it spoke to their cultural roots and heritage. And yes, yeah, some people did see improved outcomes such as, you know, lower weights or lower high blood pressures, but really, you know, it gave people a sense of pride knowing that hey, their foods do have meaning, their foods are healthy, again, kind of combating some of the other narratives that are out there. And on that topic of breaking different barriers and shifting paradigms, and, you know, Samira went into a lot of this in detail, so I won't go uh, too far into this, but, you know, for Taste of African Heritage, these lessons emphasize how affordable some of these foods are, as well as whole foods and plant-based diets in general, because a lot of the prevailing thought is that you know, this is, this is out of reach for me. I can't eat like this, but we teach how to, you know, we teach that you can find these meals in your local market. Um, in terms of palatability, you know, teach us how to flavor meals using these traditional herbs and spices and sauces while minimizing sodium. And it includes a lot of familiar foods, perhaps uh, presented in new ways. So for instance, in the program, there's the groundnut or peanut butter stew, right? So use this peanut butter, which is an ingredient that most people are familiar with in terms of like a sandwich, but we use it to um, create a, a stew that's eaten traditionally in Western Central Africa. So again, a familiar ingredient prepared in a different way. Um, it also uses ingredients that most can be found in most grocery stores. And there are also guides on finding some of these more traditional niche items should they want to uh, use those things to make that version of the recipe. And so none of the recipes in the program, we're not saying these are the definitive versions of these recipes. However, it is a version that does pay homage to a lot of um, the recipes eaten across the African diaspora. Um, and it also, it also dispels the belief that you have to sacrifice your culture for your health. As we've heard uh, multiple times during this presentation, um, you know, there's a misconception that you have to give up your cultural, your cultural foods to be healthy and stuff. And that's simply not true. You can have both. Someone asked a question earlier and I answered, you know, it's health and heritage is not an either or approach. You can include both. And then 
Again, this is also helping people rewrite the narratives around their foods and reclaim their healthy heritage. So we've seen that people who uh, come through the program, you know, they, they say that heritage is really a strong motivator for their health. And they see that diet transition really as a act of resistance against some of the uh, you know, systemic, systematic changes that are out there. And lastly, these classes build community where, you know, whether it's in a church or a restaurant or a senior center, really that communal aspect that brings people together is something that a lot of participants really love about this program. So if you would like to bring either the heritage programs to your community, here's some information on the slide there. There's a QR code you can scan. And uh, we'd love to assist you in um, teaching either the classes or bring it to your community. And in terms of takeaways, well, I'm going to get into a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to get into all of these, but just know that traditional heritage diets are full of flavor and nutrition. The foods are everywhere. Okay. Um, you know, tell it's one thing to tell someone how to eat healthy, what to eat. It's another thing to show them in a Samaritan Center. It's another thing for them to taste it, to get their hands on it, and to really experience it. And, you know, it goes without saying, you know, really embrace your patients and clients' cultural diversity. You know, make sure that they are part of the solution because you have just as much to learn from them as they are from you for the health professionals out there. So make sure that you value their background, their lived experience, and their knowledge of the foods they eat. And finally, just continue learning. Those of you that are here for this webinar, you know, you all are still learning and we're all just learning every day. So never, um, never know that you, you haven't arrived yet. There's always more to learn. And I encourage you, those who are interested more around these topics, I would look at you know, places like the Southern Foodways Alliance. They do a lot of great work around food in the South from a uh, oral history and narrative perspective. Also check out the work of Eat Well Exchange, doing work to highlight and uplift cultural foods. And then also looking back at the South, look at the organization uh, called GRITS, Growing Resilience in the South. They do a lot of great work, really dispelling some of these myths around um, traditional foods. So continue to do your research, continue to learn. And with that said, I have a quote from Michael Pollan that he said to hear of a traditional diet from any culture that isn't substantially healthier than the quote unquote standard American diet. And the more we honor these cultural differences in eating, we will, the healthier we will be. So uh, thank you all for um, being here. We're gonna take a few questions uh, that are here and then we will head. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions. So uh, let me look in the chat. Okay. So Samara, we have a question here. I think we only have time for this one, but, and this is probably a lot, but the question is, do you think there are major socioeconomic barriers to people accessing their cultural foods? If so, do you have suggestions for overcoming these barriers? Yeah, there are, there can be major socioeconomic barriers, of course, yes. Um, there are multiple levels to it. It's a complex problem. One of the ways that we try to, um, that we try to overcome that is through the implementation of community gardens, for example, and teaching people how to grow these foods themselves or even local, utilizing local community gardens to get some of the food. So whenever there's like um, food produce giveaways happening, we encourage folks to participate in that, or sometimes they may, able to, may be able to use, for example, if you need to use vouchers for these community gardens, they can do that as well. So the barriers do exist, but I think that's one way to kind of help with that. And then another question, where was it, where did it go? Question, how would you implement cultural diets to an organizational level like corporate businesses open to any suggestions? And that'd probably be our last question for this session. Oh man, and we wanna end <laughs> on this tough question, this last question, right? because I don't even know that I have the answer to that. Um, I think that it takes, okay, think about the story again with Nari, right? Um, that I mentioned, she, she was like ashamed of her foods until someone else, within that organizational structure was willing to be open to trying what she had. And so I don't think that the solution comes from any one person saying, hey guys, try my food, hey, try, try. And then we put it on our company's lunch menu. I think it takes openness of the key decision makers within that sphere in order to really affect change. And um, that is something, again, that's complex, but sometimes it may be grassroots impacting those around us. And then once the key decision makers are able to really appreciate that, then we start to see some of those changes. 
well answered and that was a great way to end this. So again, thank you to Dr. Samira Sterling for presenting your wonderful research and thank you all for attending this webinar. We will get the CEUs and recording and slides out to you within the week. In the meantime, have a great day and we will see you on the next webinar.